Well, we're delighted to welcome back Professor Robert Clancy for a, a talk on, really we're talking about the historical development of immunology because it's such a complex subject that we've decided between us that the best way to try and understand this is look at the way it's developed historically over a period of time. So, Robert, welcome. And would you like to take us back to, let's go back to, should we go back to the end of the 19th century, sort of the 1880s? What was the state of understanding at that time? The latter part of the 19th century was critical in medicine. Uh, up to that time, for 2,000 years, people understood disease as a balance of four humours. And this concept went back to the ancient Greeks, where everything, there were four components to the world and the, uh, there were four components to the body and health. And a balance between these components was what it was all about. So it, it's quite interesting. There was a study done in Sydney uh, in 1900, and 50% of doctors in 1900 still believed that uh, the four humours were the basis of disease. They probably shouldn't have, because in the 1880s, Pasteur changed the world. He found that bacteria, which had only been thought about as possible before, actually existed and could do things and that each disease would have its own bacteria. And so the idea of specificity was developed. You had a specific bug that caused this disease, another one caused that disease. And this developed into a race between Pasteur in Paris and uh, Robert Koch in Berlin. And every time a pandemic or epidemic occurred in the world, they'd send their scientists when plague came, when cholera came, you'd have one person from Cox Laboratory and one from Pasteur's Laboratory trying to find what bacteria it was that caused the disease. Now, at the same time, uh, Pasteur realised there was something in the blood that was equally specific, that when you got bug number one infecting the person, they would make something which he called an antibody, which was a good name because it was an anti against the bacteria or the virus because he was interested in rabies. So all of a sudden, the world changed. Disease medicine changed. Uh, we had specific causes and we had specific immune responses. Between Koch and Pasteur and their laboratories and their staff, uh, over a period of 5, 10, 15 years, uh, they developed the basis of modern immunology. And maybe if we can put the slide up that we have, sure. John, it, it makes some sense. To it's amazing, that. amazing. Before this, people believed in spontaneous generation of, of organisms, didn't they? That, that, that maggots come into existence inside of an apple. It's such a quantum leap, isn't it, in That's understanding? Right. Um, to, 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 yeah. to realise... Well, actually, that's... one of the many things that Pasteur did was show that it didn't exist, spontaneous generation didn't exist. And you can go to Pasteur's laboratory, you can visit that in Paris today, and the original swan neck uh, flask that mm -hmm. he did this study uh, still exists, and you can see that. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what is an antigen, Robert? Uh, uh, an antigen is what the body's immune system detects, uh, and it can be an antigen on yourself, or it can be an antigen uh, in a bacteria or a virus. It's really uh, a, a, usually a protein, but not necessarily, uh, that is detected by a specific antibody. So every antigen will have its own antibody. It might be a little bit of a COVID virus, a spike protein, uh, that will develop certain antigens. That will be an antigen that will develop uh, a repertoire of antibodies. And the important thing to realise, and this was realised very early by Pasteur and Koch, was that there's only a limit, there's about 10,000 different patterns of antigens that can exist. And so you need to be able to make an antibody against every one of those. And we now know that the body undergoes a mutational process uh, which reassorts 
all the parts of the antibody molecule to come up with about 10,000 different patterns. But what it means in practical terms is that an antibody by itself is you're only going to have a small number for every antigen, and it's not enough to stop an invasive bacterial or viral disease. So very quickly, it was recognised by the two laboratories that we're talking about that there needs to be a, a collection of molecules and a collection of cells uh, which can be told to perform an act. Uh, look at it as the antibody being a general, and every theatre of war will have its own general, that's the antibody, antibody for different theatres of war, but the foot soldiers can be the same. And so the antibody activates the molecules, and in those days it was all complement. It was called complement because the innate molecules that would be activated by the antibody complemented the antibody activity. And so you have this explosive effect because the molecules acted in what was called cascades. And the cascades were a sequence of enzymic activities so that you start off with a little bit of stimulus and then enzymes, of course, create great numbers of molecules. Each of those molecules themselves is an enzyme. That creates a great number. And it's a bit like looking at blood clotting. It's suddenly the blood's not clotting and then it's clotted because of this sequence of enzymic activities. Same Cascades with complement. Cascades of falling and dominoes. And so you are putting... Absolutely. The dominoes fell and it would blow a hole in a bacteria and the bacteria would die from osmotic lysis, blowing up with the fluids accumulating inside it. And so this innate system became incredibly important. On the other side, the innate system included cells which could gobble up and eat bacteria, which was called phagocytosis. And so very quickly in this first layer of understanding immunology, we had specific antigens causing specific antibodies. The specific antibodies would activate the complement system, make the phagocytes work more actively, and that would remove the antigen. And the idea of control of immunology was simply getting rid of this antigen. However, in the early 1900s, it was found that when you keep stimulating antigen in dogs, for example, sometimes instead of getting the protection against that infective organism, you got a blow up, you got inflammation, active inflammatory disease. And so it was recognized that the non-specific component of the innate system had to be very finely controlled because if it got out of control, not only would it kill the bacteria, but it would kill part of the ordinary self tissues. And this became known as hypersensitivity. And so, uh, sorry, an antigen uh, was injected into a, a person or a dog. It would change the way the immune response would act, you would get protection and or damage. And the damage and protection both came from the same mechanisms of innate immunity. S cells like phagocytes, molecules like the complement cascade system. And if you didn't control that process well, you would get protection but also inflammation or damage. And inflammation really just means a response to damage. Well, in this case, it was uh, basically um, the normal healthy tissues in bystander damage. It was just innocent bystanders sitting there and getting caught up like a hand grenade going off. So the hand grenade would kill the bacteria, but it would also kill some of the tissue. And so a lot of the conditions we see in humans um, are the... Uh, hypersensitivity reactions, anaphylaxis, allergies, um, vasculitis, where you get inflammation in vessels, um, T cell, uh, there are three types of hypersensitivity depending on the time and the mechanism. And so different types of antibody, different types of T cells cause this. Uh, and in fact, if we look at COVID, the, much of the damage that occurs in the gas exchange of the apparatus, particularly with the early variants of COVID, uh, was because you had uh, antigen excess. You had a lot of antigen coming in, escaping into the uh, alveoli, 
the gas exchange and the antibodies uh, that were there were causing uh, insufficient quick response. And so you blew up not just the virus, but also the, the uh, alveoli, the gas exchange, and that made people very sick. And in so that the case, sickness the, the came was not the just virus. from the virus, but the body's response to it, yeah. Yeah. In, in that case, the, the, so the, the antigen was the virus in, in that situation. I think, I think the thing yes. I didn't... Yes, Yeah, the thing I didn't understand, I think, was... I understand the antigen and the specific epitopes on the antigen generating specific antibodies. I've always thought of the antibodies as, as the, the, the sort of the bit that's actually doing the work rather than the antibodies stimulating other components of, of innate immunity. So, so my idea of the antibody, I think, has been somewhat simplistic. I imagine antibodies that sterilize, for example, or antibodies that agglutinate. But we're no, actually saying no, that antibodies no, you're, you're are you're not wrong. You're not wrong, John. Antibodies can and do neutralize the um, uh, the virus, and in fact, uh, the IgA antibody, which is a particular type of antibody you see in secretions, can prevent the virus actually attaching to the cells to infect them. So there's no question that the antibody themselves can be protective, but to actually cope with a massive amount of rapidly dividing virus or bacteria, you need to have recruit mechanisms. You've got to recruit an army to help you. I mean, the general can fire a pistol, but he can't. A pistol's not going to control um, half a million people who are fighting you, and so you have to recruit the army to, to help you do that job. So there's a pistol uh, and there's a bazooka. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. So the antibody, in a sense, is acting as a cytokine. Ah, well, I suppose uh, cytokines are, are usually smaller molecules. Uh, cytokines are completely non-specific in what they do. Antibody right. is highly specific, highly but, specific. But, but um, bad analogy. So I, I it's, 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 be... it's working as a chemical messenger then that's stimulating other parts of the immune system. Yes, yes. It, it's, 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 it, for, for those who follow rugby, it's, uh, the antibody is the 5-8. Uh, he's controlling the game. And um, uh, he has all these uh, poor, simple... Uh, people around who just barge up the front and do the damage, but the control is coming from the 5 8th. Um, I'm sure everyone here uh, is enthusiastic rugby followers. Thank you for that I. clarification, Robert. I, 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 that, 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 make, that does make sense. So we want protection, we want just the right amount, but if we get, if we get <laughs> too much. From a soccer player. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, 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 no, I, I see my, my cytokine analogy was wrong basically um so, so it's but it, it, yeah. it is the antibody that's stimulating no, no, no. Th these aspects of innate the immunity. antibody is the central we call that adaptive immunity um yeah. it's the central it's the smart part uh it's it does things but it controls things so give us some examples of inflammation causing harm what sort of diseases might people have heard of where, okay. where there's going to be inflammatory damage right the there are three broad groups probably more but three that are traditionally accepted uh, and it depends on what type of immune response is triggering the innate system in that circumstance now the first is caused by a particular type of antibody which we call ige now, these were initially known to exist, but it wasn't till really the 60s when uh, a Japanese husband-wife team identified the actual molecule. So it's relatively recent. It used to be called reagent because they knew about it. Now, for example, um, if you uh, had, uh, uh, you could actually take the, the, the serum from a patient who was allergic to nuts, for example, and you'd put, inject it in the skin and then come along and uh, eat a nut and you'd get a little red area. Uh, so that this reagent was a particular type of antibody that would stimulate a particular type of innate system. And this particular type of innate system involved 
cells called mast cells, M-A-S-T, mast cells, which released, the, released histamine and other molecules. And, and that's just sitting in the tissues, Robert, on the blood they, don't vessel. they don't circulate, they just sit They would there. sit in the tissues, they were fixed in the tissues. We then realised that this process caused hay fever, asthma and eczema as the three main conditions, the allergy conditions. And this was where about 15, 20% of people in the population are allergic people because they have lots of these IgE antibodies. And if I've got lots of IgE antibodies against ryegrass. So if I, as I have done, uh, if you do a skin test on me and just put a bit of ryegrass there, I come up in a, a big red swollen lump, which is exactly what happens if I inhale it in my nose. I get hay fever, or if it gets into my airways, I'll get some asthma. So the first of these uncontrolled innate systems was called type 1 or allergy type hypersensitivity. So here we are, we've got the antigen, which in this case is inhaled as a uh, pollen or a house dust mite, uh, activating and combining with these IgE molecules, which release histamine from the mast cell, and you get inflammation in the airways or the skin, depending on where the reaction is occurring. Uh, now, this is important with respect to uh, COVID in, in a number of ways. Uh, the first is that COVID virus is very like an inhaled allergen. The only difference is that the virus keeps dividing, but they're both antigens which you're inhaling into your airways. And so the immune response, which we'll discuss at a later time, is determined by the mucosal response in that mucosal compartment. Very different to injecting an antigen. This is inhaled antigens. And so the characteristics of that response is what determines the outcome. And we know we get IgE antibodies against COVID, inhaled COVID too, but we're uncertain at this stage the extent to which it contributes to the disease. But certainly um, what we, uh, and we'll come on to desensitization uh, and allergy shots and how that can relate to vaccination in COVID at another time. The second type, of damage, just hypersensitivity. That, Rob, the, 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 IgE, the, I, the IgE, sorry, just before we go on to the second type, is, is that what is responsible for anaphylaxis, for the extreme allergic reactions? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and, and with uh, some people who get the any vaccine, be it a, a messenger RNA vaccine or a good old fashioned type of vaccine, uh, will make IgE antibodies and they're exposed to the risk of getting immediate response. Now, of course, if it's to another injected antigen, that is not just going to occur in the skin and the airways. It's going to occur in the body as a whole. And you become flushed and your blood pressure drops. Uh, you constrict your airways and get very breathless. And it's a risk of dying. So this is a complication well known with all vaccines. It's uncommon, uncommon. But uh, many cases have been described with the uh, COVID vaccine because the COVID vaccine, and again, as we'll discuss, has an uncontrolled amount of antigen, whereas the traditional antigen, you put a tiny, winny little bit into the muscle, uh, even if it gets absorbed into a, a blood vessel, for example, uh, you've only got a very small amount. But with the COVID vaccine, you're actually injecting genetic information, which goes to cells throughout the body, all of which, or many of which, can make the antigen on its surface. And so you're more liable to get anaphylaxis there than you would be with a traditional vaccine, in, in, in my view. Uh, and these numbers are a little bit woolly. So, so anaphylaxis so we're, we're, is uh, an immediate hypersensitivity reaction occurring with right across with systemically in the whole body. Yeah, so, so it, it's if you get many mast cells that are expressing IgE and they're all activated at the same time, you essentially get mass release of histamine from the mast cells. Is that is that what's happening? Exactly, exactly. So it's a bit like That's rolling up the sleeve and, and so giving me getting... an intravenous injection of, of histamine. Yes, exactly, exactly, which you don't do very often. No, I, I wouldn't do uh, I wouldn't do that. And, um, so IgE, no, that's, and you're IgE, fine. 
Yeah, IgE presumably has physiological effects. We've talked about IgE pathologically, but presumably we have to have just we're supposed to have just the right amount of IgE. Oh, absolutely. Uh, IgE, like all of the components of the immune response, um, are, are there for, for good outcomes. And we as humans evolved in association with a whole range of microbes, and particularly worms. Um, and we know that uh, worms, the IgE system, uh, directs the mast cells and other cells called eosinophils, which come in as a result of this uh, and collectively, this system of, of mast cells and eosinophils, uh, which can punch holes in the, uh, in the parasites, in the worms, uh, are very effective. And so the IgE system probably evolved in humans as a way of protecting against worms from the environment. Uh, it's just these days, m most of us living in Western countries don't get exposed to a lot of worms, but it just translates back into the downside. Uh, of a worm eradicating system uh, in relation to inhaled house dust mite, um, pollens, uh, and very latex if you're working in, as a nurse uh, on your gloves. I, I worked in a hospital where uh, we had several nurses who were getting anaphylaxis from latex, and of course uh, some glove batches have lots of latex and others for some reason don't. And whenever a new batch of gloves came into the hospital, uh, these particular nurses were very quick to see if it caused a reaction on their skin. And if a batch didn't, those, that batch would disappear very, very quickly <laughs> from, the, uh, from the stores. Yeah. The we actually went latex-free about, about, about 10, 12 years ago. We went to latex-free gloves. Oh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm yeah. going back a few years. Yeah. yeah. And you, talking about worms, Robert, you and I have worked in, in poorer areas, and we know that if you treat someone who's got a swollen tummy with bendazole, mabendazole, one of the anti-worm medicines, people actually poo out huge bulk of, of uh, gastrointestinal worms. This is a real big problem. It's just that we don't come into oh, contact with it on a... I, 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 I can remember my introduction to, to worms was uh, as a, a junior resident doctor, uh, in a teaching hospital in Sydney, uh, I had a little Aboriginal boy uh, as a patient uh, from far west. And um, uh, he uh, just, I don't know why, but I, I just examined his, his feces and there were sort of nine, nine completely different worms. <laughs> no, and my, my senior doctors just said, oh, well, you know, um, you know, that's not all that uncommon. So uh, worms have been something with us for evolutionally for a long, long time. Hence the IgE system as, as being absolutely essential. And the IgE system, yeah. So that was the first now one. Now, the, the second that, type of mold. Yeah, second type. Oh, I was just saying that the second type occurs, uh, the first type occurs within minutes. The second type occurs within hours. And that is where you actually get um, the IgG, which is the main antibody class in the serum in the blood, uh, the IgG antibody combining with the antigen and activating the complement system, which I talked about before. Uh, and uh, while this can be very effective, if it's out of control, because we're talking in general terms about focusing the hand grenade so it only blows up what you want it to blow up, but if it doesn't, if it's delayed in its activity, it builds up, uh, and you have a lot of activity, then you get a delayed, well, not too delayed, but after several hours you get a response and in the small blood vessels in the body because this is occurring right throughout the body. And you get some kidney involvement, you get joint involvement, you get fever, you get rash. And this was first seen when the antibodies were recognised to be protective and very cleverly, doctors said, well, let's immunise horses. Uh, horses can make um, the antibody, the IgG antibody, and the uh, IgG antibody can be taken as serum from the horse and given to a patient with pneumonia, for example. That was called passive immunisation. Uh, the passive immunisation um, then was uh, highly effective, but it was a foreign IgG that was being put into the human 
And so the body made antibodies against IgG antibodies against the IgG and the proteins in the horse serum, and they got hypersensitivity, uh, and they got what was called serum sickness. And probably 30 or 40 percent of people whose lives may be saved as a result would also end up uh, a few days, a week or so later, uh, developing um, changes in their urine. Uh, aches and pains in the joints, skin rash, fever, and feeling quite unwell, which was called serum sickness. But in fact, it was a hypersensitivity reaction uh, mediated by a second immunoglobin or, or, or antibody molecule called IgG. So we had the immediate, now we had the intermediate or the one occurring after hours. So it's now human that is IgG. also the basis of... That was... Human IgG so it, against the horse. Horse IgG, <laughs> which of course yeah. is, is, is very different. I I I, th I think of um, well, that, that, just the, that was that was then realised to be the cause of many other human diseases against autoantigens. For example, in systemic lupus erythematosus, most people know that as SLE. You're making an immune response against your own antigens. And that causes these hypersensitivity reactions in the small blood vessels. And you get arthritis, you get skin involvement, kidney involvement, in fact, a whole range of other Great involvements. Part, anyway. Again, because of this hypersensitivity reaction. Yes. So, so the interaction between the IgG and the antigen is, is causing the stimulation of complement. Now, I think of complement as essentially sharp, hollow toilet rolls got a hole down the middle and when they puncture a cell that lets the water from outside into the cell and the cell basically blows up is that too crude or is that roughly what complement is no no that, that's that's how they work but uh, it happens there's a sequence of eight or nine of these complement to get to, to get to molecules the toilet roll. and you can get that's right that's the toilet roll but halfway down the toilet roll various molecules get shot off from the enzymic activity that bring in white cells and the white cells cause a lot of damage by releasing their enzymes and so along the line of the toilet roll you can have different inflammatory outcomes so, so intermediate versions of complement are stimulating other parts of the immune system such as white blood cells and of yes, course white blood yes. cells contain things that kill bacteria but in the wrong place can also kill bits of us that's right, and that's what they're trying to do. But if it's inappropriate and excessive because it's not being controlled, then not only does it kill the bacteria, but it kills the tissue that the bacteria are in, causing damage. So specifically, do we have some disease names that go with this IgG antigen interaction? Or is it just the well, specific? A, we call it vasculitis because there's inflammation in the vessels, but it occurs in rheumatoid arthritis, it occurs in systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, Henoch Schonlein. Uh, there's a huge number of these autoimmune conditions because the antigen is self-antigen. So it's basically autoimmune, but it's the hypersensitivity to the autoantigen that's causing the actual damage. It's a sequence yeah. of reactions. And, and so this is, this is another aspect of the way that inflammation can be so damaging if it's... Uh inappropriate exactly. if, if it's a friendly fire sort of situation yeah it is friendly fire yeah so we've got the igg in minutes we've got the uh, uh sorry the ige in minutes the igg in hours what was the third one robert the, the third one wasn't understood when it was first described it was first really looked at by robert cock uh and he found that because remember <clears throat> at this time the biggest killer around, uh, something like 40% of people were dying from tuberculosis. It was a huge issue. And so Robert Koch wanted to make his name uh, by coming up with a vaccine against tuberculosis. And he grew the organism, because he was the first to do that, and extracted from it uh, a, a protein which was called tuberculin. Not a lot of imagination, but there's very little imagination in immunologists. But he took tuberculin and injected it in the skin. And one to two days later, not minutes or not hours, as you do with IgE and IgG, but days, there was this inflammatory response, swelling and redness. 
Now, he thought, ah, I've got an antigen that I can immunise people with TB. And this was his one big mistake and nearly destroyed him uh, professionally because he was using the tuberculin, which he was using as a skin test, which indicated that tuberculosis was present in the body. So it became the MAN2 test that many people watching will have had. And the MAN2 test came from, is tuberculin being injected just in, under the skin to see if you can make a hypersensitivity reaction. And you'll only make that reaction if you've actually got or had tuberculosis. So the cells have been sensitised. And this is where the T cells come in. But of course, we didn't know about T cells. Um, sooner or later after this, it was shown that you could transfer that type of what was called delayed type hypersensitivity with lymphocytes. But this again was long before uh, Jacques Miller discovered the idea of T or thymus derived cells. So cellular immunity became recognised but not understood. And it was shown that the at the time, it wasn't understood how these things work. But if you biopsied these little lesions in the skin, you'd find lots of activated phagocytes or macrophages. And so the cells that came in were the not recognised T cells, but they would be secreting what you mentioned as cytokines uh, that would then recruit the macrophages and activate them to gobble up the uh, the. the TB organisms or other organisms. And, and, and what, what specific diseases are we talking about here with the, with the T cell mediated? We're talking, uh, well, one that most people would know these days would be Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a cellular hypersensitivity reaction to bacteria that are leaking into the lining of the small or large bowel. Uh, tubercul a lot of infections are caused largely by the uh, inflammatory response, the T-cell mediated delayed hypersensitivity, classically tuberculosis. Uh, particularly viruses and bacteria that continue in the body inside cells uh, because the T-cell response is particularly relevant to infections that become contained within cells. And so if uh, oh, I worked as a, as a medical student, I worked in a, as a wardsman in a TB ward and actually got tuberculosis, but I never had symptoms. And when I did my, my um, tuberculin test, my whole arm swelled swell up, so I, I took anti-tuberculous treatment at the time, but um, I never actually got clinical tuberculosis because my T cells were able to contain that. And, and that... Probably today, 30-40% of the population are in the same position. We've had tuberculosis, but we live in a, a climate where we, we eat well, we keep fit, uh, very different to the 19th century when people were not as fit and they weren't as well nourished uh, and they weren't uh, as, as fit as we are today. And they would get uncontro uncontrolled um, tuberculosis, which was partly the bug and partly the uncontrolled hypersensitivity activity of the T cells. Uh, now, um, if I, for example, have something requiring corticosteroid treatment, that can dull the T cells, which still are actively containing my tuberculous organisms. Uh, and so you, you have to be extremely careful. Um, uh, in New Zealand, uh, they had a lot of people coming from Polynesia uh, to work in New Zealand, and they had various invasive parasites, particularly worms, that were contained by these T cells. And they also came to uh, a different environment and got asthma. And they'd go to the hospital and they'd, oh, give them prednisone, which is how you can treat acute asthma, not realising they had these contained uh, invasive uh, worms. And suddenly there was an epidemic of people getting invasive worm disease because they'd taken away the protective T cell uh, containment. Uh, so there are many, many different conditions. Uh, T cells are very, very important for chronic control, chronic inflammatory disease. I think that's such an important fundamental principle, isn't it? Never give steroids to suppress inflammation if there's a possibility of an infectious component, whether it's viral. You're never bacteria. changing the natural history, really, are you? you yeah. Steroids will just take away uh, the hypersensitivity component. 
of the disease, which can be life-saving, you know, uh, oh, yeah. tuberculous meningitis. Uh, in young children, you give them steroids to stop the inflammatory response, even though you're not going to be... Re you've got to also give the anti-tuberculous uh, um, uh, drugs uh, to kill the bacteria. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of our understanding of immunity series, looking at the historical development of immunity to allow us to understand this complex subject. So thank you very much, Professor Robert Clancy. And do keep an eye out for part two, which will be along soon.